You can hear a maester coming long before you see him, thanks to the jangling chains he's forced to wear around his neck. It's meant to remind him of his servitude, like the collar of a dog. He can't remove it, even to sleep. Each link signifies mastery, or at least what those withered old men in the Citadel consider mastery, of a different area of study. Gold for the study of sums and accounts, silver for healing, iron for war, black iron for ravenry, lead for poisons, and valyrian steel for the higher mysteries. Only one maester in a hundred forges such a link. Only one maester in a hundred has the sense the gods gave a goat. Though I admit that no one has performed true magic in centuries. We sit in a room, mumbling over a candle of dragon glass, trying to make it catch fire. After a sleepless night of failure, we're supposed to admit to our own limitations. To win the link, we are supposed to lose our curiosity. I never did. In time, the Archmaesters decided more links were useless to a man who wouldn't be chained by them. They took my chain and expelled me from the Citadel. Their loss. The chain as a whole is supposed to signify the realm. One cannot have only lords or only knights. One needs farmers, smiths, merchants, shepherds, and the like. Like a chain forged of many different metals. An obvious and trivial point, disguised with pomposity. Much like the maesters themselves. They study without learning and proudly pass down the same knowledge that was passed down to them with no addition. Perhaps such is to be expected when one considers the kinds of men who become maesters. The youngest sons of noble families, dutiful and timid, raised in the shadow of their older brothers. Or bastards and peasant boys whose minds are easily satisfied by the knowledge of their next meal. Because bold men will not be chained. They dare to ask questions that the maesters fear to answer. They will look at a living man and ask, how? And they will look at the dead and ask, what if? The Iron Bank dates from when Bravos was still the secret city filled with runaways and refugees from the Valyrian slave lords. The first tradesmen to achieve success realized that if they pooled their resources, they could loan money to their less fortunate fellows and build a better Bravos. For a profit, of course. First, they needed a space to store their combined gold, safe from thieves, and more importantly, each other. For the business rivalries that created their fortunes were not easily put aside. They found an abandoned iron mine outside the city and sealed its only entrance with heavy gates and bars, and set guards supplied by every principal investor. Each guard watched the gate, and the other guards. Over time, this distrust vanished as the investors gave up their other businesses and poured their energies into the new endeavor, now called the Iron Bank, after the mine. We've since moved to more spacious quarters, but we still keep our first vault, not merely to remind us of our roots, but because we did not become the world's greatest repository of wealth by wasting assets, no matter how minor. If you're an aspiring merchant, you come to us to buy ships and goods. If you're an aspiring shopkeeper, you come to us to buy your shop. Whatever you need in this world, we are the conduit. Even a throne can be yours if you're an aspiring king, or stay yours if you're a sitting one. Just ask House Lannister of Westeros. We are not the only bank in this world. Every free city has its own, but when those banks need gold, they come to us. We lend to princes, kings, merchants, and tradesmen. If a prince or king can't pay us back, well, the world lacks for loyal men, not ambitious ones. We simply fund the rise of new princes and kings, and they tend to honor our investment. If a merchant refuses to repay us, well, the vicissitudes of trade are well known, and Bravos is full of men who are not. One way or another, the Iron Bank will have its due. Sell sword, pretty much sums it up. A poor man has a sword. A rich man needs a man with a sword. 
gold is exchanged. If the poor man knows how to use the sword, maybe he becomes the rich man, one way or another. I'm sure cell swords have a long and illustrious history, but if you meet a cell sword who knows it, best hire someone else. A cell sword should be good at one thing, getting paid to kill people. It's not an easy job. Most people try to kill you back, and at least a few of them know how. The ones that don't, well, they often come in enough pretty armor to ruin an afternoon. A lot of high lords turn their noses up at cell swords. They say they can't trust a man who sells his allegiance to the highest bidder. I don't blame them. Much cheaper for them to own an army from birth, either by people being on their lands or by their ancestors swearing a few oaths. But here's the thing. No sellsword has ever fled from the winning side. If your hired companies are running away from you, it's because you're not on that side. And you didn't pay them enough to die with you. Not that you could. Sellswords don't get rich dying for their lords. Sellswords don't really get rich. Some of the eastern companies on Essos do fine. The Golden Company, the Second Sons, the Windblown. Always a bit of fighting to be had in the free cities. Even if those merchant princes can be as tight as an old man's cunt. But then you're stuck in the heat and dust, hoping some dumb rich prick doesn't try to hire your company to fight Dothraki. Because your dumb greedy captain would probably take it. Hedge Knights, now, are a different breed. Take a cell sword and remove the scents. They get their name from where they sleep, under the edges of the Seven Kingdoms, in ditches, in stables. They don't have the family name or the purse like real knights, so they spend all their money on armor and a horse and ride in tourney after tourney in the hope of impressing some lord or winning some prize. One loss, and a lot of them are ruined. They can't ransom back their armor, even if they win. Think what a knight's good for, killing men. You know how you train for killing men? by trying to kill men, not prancing around with a blunted stick, bowing and waiting your turn. Maybe you think I'm just insulting the competition so you hire me instead. Well, of course I am. So don't hire me. Hire a sellsword with educated heirs who tells you all about the great battles he's heard of, or a hedge knight who's won a few tourneys starting to build his name. And the man you're fighting against? He hires me. Wild lynx. I suppose that's flattery coming from your southerners that kneel to a pig if your daddy did. We call ourselves the Free Folk. Or at least most of us won't kill you for calling us so. Some will, aye. But that's just the way of it in the true north. Beyond your great white wall. Where your laws and kingdoms end. And men live free. And die cold. For we live close to our land, and she's a terrible wife. Fail to obey her, and she kills you. On the frozen shore, so deep is the snow that men ride chariots made of walrus bones pulled by packs of dogs. The Hornfords have it easier in the mountains. The cold so hardens and blackens the soles of their feet that they don't even need boots. The cave people spend their lives in the dark, doing gods know what with gods know who, or what. The Thens have one of the only nice bits of land up here, a valley in the far north, near the end of the frost fangs, with game, copper, and tin for shiny bronze weapons. Better than the rusted old blades most of us have. With such advantages, they could be a generous, friendly race. They're not. As young boys, they burn their faces and rub ash and dirt into their wounds. Scars more than their face, I think. They follow their Magnar, who's the kind of man who can rule these kinds of men. I know what you southerners are thinking. And no, the Magnar is not a king. More like their god. Though not one you'd care to follow if you don't sleep with your eyes open. Then there are the giants. A proud race, as old as the frost fangs, and about as tough. They speak the old tongue, when they speak at all, though they understand more common than they let on. They're not the monsters you southerners think. Once I was caught in a winter storm so cold, I knew it freeze to death before it broke. Lucky for me, I stumbled on a sleeping giant, cut open her belly, and crawled right up inside her. Kept me warm enough but the stink nearly done me. The worst thing was, 
When she woke up, she took me for her babe. Suckled me for three whole moons before I could get away. Hehe. <laughs> Aye, but there's times I still miss the taste of giant's milk. I thank the gods she was in a good mood and lacked a husband. An angry giant, you want no part of that. Whatever our differences, one thing unites us. When we look south, we see hundreds of feet of ice piled high, manned by shivering crows in black cloaks. Our wardens penning us up here, warning us away from warmer lands, softer beds, and prettier girls. But the cold winds are rising. The Hornfoots couldn't stand against them, nor the Thens, nor the Giants. First, they kill you. Then they send your dead against you. We faced extinction, every one of us. But then man's raider came to us and rallied every nation of the free folk as no man ever has. He was a crow once and knows your ways. For thousands of years, we've sucked fear of your kind from our mother's teeth. We've been on one side of the wall and you on the other. No more. One of these nights, you're going to hear a knock on your front door. You best not answer. Nobody really knows how the wall was built. Yes, every child hears how, in the days of the First Men, Brandon the Builder raised the wall with magic and giants and set the Night's Watch to guard it. But nobody thought to write down the story until thousands of years later, and the Septons who did it weren't much for accuracy. I mean, they have knights bumbling around thousands of years before they were knights. Sorry, bad habit. But even if magic and giants built the wall, it's the Night's Watch who have held it. Our order of builders repairs the keeps and towers, digs tunnels, crushes stone for roads and footpaths, and clears away trees wherever the forest presses too close to the wall. Or at least it would, if they had the men, and the tools, and the time. Long ago, when the Night's Watch was at full strength, the builders would quarry blocks of ice from the frozen lake to the haunted forest, dragging them south on sledges to add to the wall. Now it's all they can do to watch for cracks or signs of melt and make what repairs they can, without men, or tools, or time. The Order of Rangers is the fighting heart of the Night's Watch. They ride beyond the wall, fighting and trading with wildlings, surviving shadow cats and snow leopards. The Rangers are meant to scout out threats to the wall and return to report. And they did, back in the days when men could go north and come back alive. Now they just come back. The Order of Stewards keeps the Watch alive. We hunt and farm, tend the horses, milk the cows, gather firewood, cook the meals and bring supplies from the south. Not so heroic, I know, but since the Night's Watch doesn't starve or freeze, I guess we're the only order that still does everything it's supposed to. Without all of us guarding the wall together, well, it probably still wouldn't have ever fallen. Solid ice rising hundreds of feet into the air and running hundreds of miles to the sea, no army is smashing it anytime soon, which is why our enemies have never tried. Well, not directly. The brothers Gendel and Gorn, kings beyond the wall, went under the wall through ancient caves buried deep in the earth. But on the way back, they took a wrong turn and were lost in the darkness. People say that their children's children's children are still down there, looking for a way up, or for more food to find its way down. When our rangers found Arse and Isaacs picking away at the wall, he was almost halfway through. The rangers decided not to disturb him and sealed the way behind him with ice and stone and snow. Some say if you press your ear flat to the wall, you can still hear Arson chipping away with his axe. A hundred years ago, another king beyond the wall, Raymond Redbeard, realized the wall's size is both its greatest strength and its greatest weakness. He waited for our patrols to pass and then sent climbers to the now unguarded stretch of the wall. When they reached the top, they dropped ropes and ladders for thousands more wildlings to clamber up. The Night's Watch didn't even know his army had crossed until after the Starks and Umbers had cornered and destroyed him. And that was a hundred years ago when the Watch had many more men than now. Lucky for the Night's Watch, the wall isn't without its own defences. Besides being incredibly tall and thick, the wall is also treacherous. Many times a patrol will find the broken corpses of wildlings who've tried to climb the wall, only for a piece of it to break off mid-climb, or to have their hold slip as the sun melted the ice just enough. When the light strikes the wall just right, it can even look like it's weeping. 
A thousand years ago, the Night's Watch could have lined up shoulder to shoulder along the wall, all the way from East Watch by the Sea to the Shadow Tower, to meet Mance Raider and his army. But now, Mance isn't bothering to find tunnels under the wall, or climb over it. He was a sworn brother once. He knows that the glory of the Night's Watch is behind us. Mance is going to try what no man ever has. He's going to come through the wall. One day, I hope Maesters write stories about how we beat him back. Because if we don't, there may not be any more stories to write. From the east coast of the Vale, the fingers reach out into the narrow sea. Four rocky peninsulas plagued by wind and rain, and barren to all but the hardiest of weeds. The ancestral home of House Baelish. Our house began with my great-grandfather, a Bravosi sellsword who came to the Vale at the invitation of House Corbray. My grandfather raised himself to the status of Hedge Knight, and even managed to acquire a bit of land and a keep on the smallest of the fingers, though I do believe he often missed sleeping under his titular hedges. The only thing worse than owning a dreary and desolate land is owning only a small portion of it. Luckily, I didn't spend much time there as a child. During the War of the Ninepenny Kings, a cheap name for a cheap cause, where other men fought for the king my father fought to befriend Hoster Tully, Lord Paramount of the Trident and head of one of the oldest and greatest houses in Westeros. Thanks to my father's heroic efforts, Lord Hoster agreed to foster me at Riverrun with his own children. Until then, my whole world had been a small tower on the gull-stained rocks of the Fingers. But when I first saw the stone walls of Riverrun rising from the trident towering over me, back then I was a little more easily impressed. The boy in me thought the gods themselves must live in such a place. I soon learned otherwise. Lord Tully's son, Edmure, was quick to ensure I would never forget myself in their house. He nicknamed me Littlefinger after my size and homeland, and the name was just cruel enough to stick. His sisters, Lysa and Catelyn, made me a pawn in their kissing game, traded back and forth between them for practice. Needless to say, I enjoyed spending time with them more than Edmure. As we grew older, the game began to change, as all games do. Lysa grew more bold, and Cat more demure. When Lord Tully announced Cat's betrothal to a brute from the north whom she'd never met, I realized her duty would outweigh any feelings she had for me. Fool that I was, I challenged this Brandon Stark to a duel for her hand. He was a warrior, I was a boy. If Cat had not intervened, he would have killed me and laughed over my corpse. For my insolence, Lord Tully banished me from River Run. No matter, I had learned everything I needed by then. I would fight my battles not with swords, but with wits. A few men could match me. Even then, House Baelish might have died out on the rocks of the Fingers. I was again a poor lord, with no allies and no prospects, except, if I were lucky, the daughter of a middling merchant. Then, opportunity arose. The Mad King executed that Brandon Stark and incited a rebellion. My old friend, Lysa Tully, was married off to John Arryn, Lord of the Vale, to cement the alliance against the Iron Throne, bringing her within my circle again. I quickly capitalized on our former affection and persuaded her to have me appointed as controller of customs at Gulltown, the Vale's greatest port. Wars burn gold like wildfire. When I increased the port's income tenfold, her husband took notice of this lowly lord from the fingers and when the new and profligate King Robert needed a master of coin who could find gold where no one else could, why, Lord Arryn knew just the man. Once, House Baelish had no lands, no name, and no gold. Now we have quite a lot of each. What new rung will the next generation climb? Let us not be hasty. I'm not finished yet. Any man who calls a poison a woman's weapon is a traitor to his fellow men. A dagger, arrow, axe, these are the arms of passion. But poison is cold, calculating. Poison is the thought that wakes you in the morning and lulls you to sleep at night. You watch your victim die a thousand times before you ever offer him that fateful taste. 
is a man's hate so inferior to a woman's that we are to be denied such a weapon? When I was a boy of 16, a great lord caught me with his mistress. He should have been honored. Instead, the fat old fool challenged me to a duel, thanks to my age and status only to first blood. But his mistress and his wife warned me which of my parts he intended to draw first blood from. He was strong and fierce, but slow. I cut him quickly and the duel ended with honor satisfied. Then his wounds festered and he died. Ever since, men have called me the Red Viper, a name that never fails to draw a laugh from me, as if a single serpent was all I knew of venom. Essence of Nightshade is the gentlest of poisons. A drop dissolved into wine will slow a pounding heart and stop a hand from shaking. Three drops will grant a night of deep and dreamless sleep. Ten drops, and you will have a sleep that does not end. Basilisk blood. It will give cooked meat a savory smell. But if eaten, it produces violent madness in beasts as well as men. A mouse will attack a lion after a taste of basilisk blood. But to a man who knows his art, is not passion a form of madness? Widow's blood forces a man's bladder and bowels to fail. He drowns in his own poisons, a slow and painful death. It has earned its name many times, I am sure. The Tears of Lys, a rare and costly poison. Clear, tasteless, and odorless. Dissolved in wine or water, it eats at a man's bowels. He dies in agony, which will not appear unusual if the victim is old or sickly. A favorite tool of impatient heirs. Across the world, on certain islands of the Jade Sea, grows a certain plant. The leaves must be aged and soaked in a wash of limes, sugar water, and certain rare spices from the Summer Isles. Afterward, the potion must be thickened with ash and allowed to crystallize. The process is slow and difficult, the necessary is costly and hard to acquire. The alchemists of Lys know the way of it, and the faceless men of Bravos and the Maesters. Dissolved in wine, it makes the muscles of a man's throat clench tighter than any fist. A victim's face turns as purple as the little crystal seed from which his death was grown. And so we call it the Strangler. Which of these vials would I take from its shelf, you may ask? None. To kill a man at his table or in his bed bores me. To toil hours over a boiling pot measuring and stirring bores me. How life begins is always entertaining, and my kind must make sure its end is worth our wait. Unbowed, unbent, unbroken. The words of House Martel a promise to our enemies and a challenge to our lovers. Thousands of years ago, the warrior queen Nymeria crossed into Dorne from Essos, fleeing the dragon lords of Validia. After she landed, she burned her ships, all 10,000 of them, so no cowards could slink home. What a woman, Dornish in spirit before she ever was in flesh. She was lucky to land in Dorne where powerful women are not locked away in seps and the beds of old men. My ancestor, Mors Martel, saw her and desired her, and proved that where armies fail, a tongue may succeed. Wedding his strength to hers, his spear to her son, they subdued all his rivals together. After the tradition of her people, House Martel then ruled Dorne as princes, not kings. Unless the eldest child was a daughter, for unlike the rest of Westeros, our loyalty isn't commanded by a cock. We follow a prince or a princess Martel just the same. And we always have. Some people forget that Aegon Targaryen crowned himself lord of six kingdoms, not seven. When his sister marched on Dorne, she found no mighty hosts drawn up against her for her dragon to burn and her soldiers to slaughter. The sands swirled, men died, and her dragon saw nothing. The sun shone, men died, and her dragon bowed to our greater fire. The Targaryens retreated with their tails tucked between their legs. 
Of course, in later years, his descendants would try again. Daeron I succeeded at great cost and reigned in Dorne for a few glorious months. One night, his steward pulled down a sash by his bed to summon his consorts. Instead, the canopy split open and a hundred red scorpions fell on him. He was a Tyrell. You would think he would be used to getting stung. Within a fortnight, House Martel again ruled a free Dorne. Eventually, after centuries of courtship, House Martel got into bed with the Targaryens. We took King Daeron II and his sister for our own before they could take each other, and six kingdoms became seven. Even now, I do not blame my ancestors. One look at those long, silver locks. It is not every day a man gets to ride a dragon. But they soon learned that you can't leap off a dragon at will. My sister Elia, she married Prince Rhaegar Targaryen and became the princess she already was. In Dorne, she walked among vipers and none would bite her. In King's Landing, she found herself surrounded by lions. When Robert Baratheon rebelled against his rightful king, his future father-in-law, Tywin Lannister, ordered his beast, Gregor Clegane, to rape and murder my sister, along with her helpless children and men called the Lannisters heroes. Now, Lannisters sit on the Iron Throne, surrounded by the blasted swords of Aegon's broken foes. I wonder if they remember, as I do, that none of those swords are ours. I wonder if they see, as I do, my sister's red blood soaking into the stones of their precious red keep. Maybe they need reminding. The lion may be a mighty beast, but pride always lifts his gaze to the horizon, never seeing in the grass the viper. Fire made flesh. Such is the nature of dragons, claim the Eastern mystics. For once they may have a point, though not the one they think. Fire consumes leaving at its end naught but ash. Thus the fate of the Targaryens and their dragons. Thousands of years ago, Valyrian stumbled on the first dragon eggs in the mountains of the Fourteen Fires. I cannot imagine shepherds could hatch dragon eggs and bind such creatures to their will, but whatever aid they must have had is lost to history. Every educated person knows how the Dragon Lords then conquered most of the known world, breaking the ancient Giscari Empire, enslaving a continent, building roads and bridges that still stand today, though the art that made them is lost. An empire of marvels and misery. And now what is left of Valyria? A smoking wasteland. Ash. In time, Aegon Targaryen and his sisters brought their three dragons who had escaped the doom to Westeros, perhaps thinking to regain his people's lost glory. And so he did. On the field of fire, he proved that armies were no match for dragons. At Harrenhal, he proved that mighty castles weren't either. Aegon Targaryen became Aegon the Conqueror, first of his name, founder of a dynasty. His first act? to order his dragon Valerian, the Black Dread, to melt the swords of his beaten foes into his new Iron Throne. For over a hundred years, the Targaryen dragons cemented their breeders' hold on the Seven Kingdoms, if not each other. When Targaryen fought Targaryen in the civil war called the Dance of the Dragons, an angry mob stormed the dragon pit. That huge, now ruined vault where the Targaryens stabled their beasts. Thousands died, but through sheer numbers and madness, five of the Targaryen dragons lay dead by the morning. Which was perhaps too many. Thereafter, each generation of dragons grew smaller than its parents. Their skulls used to line the throne room of the Red Keep in order of birth. The oldest, Balerion, could swallow an ox whole. The last skull was barely the size of a dog's. Yet the Targaryens never stopped trying to revive their dragons. Arian Brightflame drank a draught of wildfire, 
and burned to death. Aegon V tried to hatch stone dragon eggs with sorcery and burned to death. Against these, Aerys II looks almost sensible. He only burned other men to death. <laughs> now we hear rumors that the young Daenerys Targaryen has hatched three dragons far to the east. If she were to be so foolish as to march on Westeros, she will not find, as her ancestor Aegon did, seven disparate kingdoms frightened by her strange beasts. She will find a continent united behind Lord Tywin Lannister, who extinguished her own father's flame. And we have known dragons now. We have seen them die. Justice is a funny thing. For the poor, it's what keeps them alive. And starving, depending on how the local lord feels about his woods, his streams, his crops. For the rich, justice is what you get if you're not careful enough, or rich enough. Usually how it works is, you commit a crime and the local lord sends his guards after you. Or your victim's family kills you and the guards go after them instead. Or you do nothing and the guards come after you anyway. Either way, Someone is brought before the Lord and he decides what's to be done. Could be a fine if you're rich enough to pay. Otherwise, it's the dungeons, the chopping block, or the wall. You'd think most folks would choose the wall. The North is nasty, dark, and cold, but so are most dungeons. And every man knows how the Night's Watch earn their name. All they can do is watch. I don't blame the men who choose a quick chop rather than life without one of its few joys. If you're in the capital, it's the King's Justice who takes your head. Elsewhere in the south, the headsman of the local lord. But in the north, it's the lord himself. The man who passes the sentence should swing the sword, they say up there. Sounds noble, but given some of the northern lords I've met, they just don't want anyone else spoiling their fun. If you're so unlucky to be in the Vale when you're caught, you might never make it to sentencing thanks to their sky cells. Open on one side to a long fall, with the floor sloping down towards it like a woman's thighs. After a few days, they say the sky starts calling to you. Men jump with smiles on their faces, expecting the wind to lift them into the sky. It doesn't. To think Lord Tyrion was one tit-shaped cloud away from death. Lucky for him, he was highborn. If your family honor goes back hundreds of years to a time when your ancestors hit other men harder than they were hit, you have another option. Trial by combat. You either fight your accuser or you both pick champions to fight on your behalf, and the gods will favor the righteous man. As long as he's also the strongest, the quickest, or the luckiest. Once in a long while, you may get two real high-born shits having a go at each other, and one of them might be fool enough to demand a trial by seven. Exactly how it sounds, seven men against seven men. Makes for a good show, I guess, but any man who's been in battle knows that the more men involved, the less skill needed, the more chance of accidents. Just ask that Targaryen prince who got his head staved in by his brother all those years ago, and all for some hedge knight. If you ever find yourself arrested in the Seven Kingdoms, just remember that justice is up to the judge. Beg him for forgiveness, or pay him for it, or ask to be allowed to take the black. But remember that he doesn't have to let you. There are plenty of lords out there who think hands and heads are great decorations for their spikes. The Septons claim that justice is of the gods, Nice of them to keep it up there to themselves. Iron chainmail and steel plate over the chest. Metal gauntlets over the hands and greaves over the legs. A visored helm over the skull. A knight in full armor can shrug off swords, spears, and axes. But Valyrian steel slices through his protections like so much cloth. As advanced as iron is from bronze, so is Valyrian steel from ordinary steel. Lighter yet stronger, and nothing holds an edge like it. If you take a whetstone to a Valyrian blade, you'll need another whetstone, and maybe another hand to hold it. Nobody knows how the Valyrians forge their steel. Less than a handful of smiths can now even reshape it. The process, like so much of their civilization, was lost in the doom. Many claim they wove magic spells into the molten metal and blasted it with dragonfire. When you see a Valyrian blade, smoky and dark as if drinking in the sun and rippling with a thousand folds, you may not scoff so loudly. 
The Valyrian steel that exists now is all there will ever be. Some survives in the citadel with the maester's chains, where a link of Valyrian steel signifies study of the higher mysteries, whatever those are. Some drifts through the world as prized daggers and jewelry for rich merchants. I've even seen a Dothraki Arak. But much more of Valyrian steel lives on in the great houses of Westeros as their most treasured possession. A sword passed down from father to son for generations. Ice of House Stark. Heartsbane of House Tarly. Lady Forlorn of House Corbray. But even precious treasures can be lost. Aegon Targaryen's Blackfire and Visenya's Dark Sister disappeared in Daemon Blackfire's rebellion. A foolish king of the rock took House Lannister's bright roar to Valyria, and neither blade nor man was seen again. And then there are the swords that are not lost, but lose their owners. For five centuries, Longclaw was the pride of House Mormont, my house. Even penniless and in great debt, I chose to sell men rather than the sword. And when my shame became known and I fled Bear Island for the east, I left it behind for my father, to hold it for a worthier heir. Valyrian steel is a wonder of the world, sharper than wits, truer than men, rarer than virtue. But even its edge cannot cut so deeply as a son's failure, nor its value match that of redemption. Sex. A simple word for a simple act. And so, of course, men complicate it. A child born to a wife is a gift from the gods. A child born to a mistress or an obedient serving girl is a bastard, unworthy of its father's name. So instead, we call the children after the land where they were born. Flowers in the rich and hill in the westerlands, stone in the vale and storm in the stormlands, rivers in the riverlands and waters in the groundlands. Pike in the Iron Islands, snow in the north, and in Dorn, sand. By these names, everyone can recognize a bastard, <laughs> even if his own father won't. Though sometimes a father with too much gold and daughters will ask the king to legitimize a bastard son and give him his family name. If his wife objects, the next one does not. But sometimes the gods play their jokes and later his wife will give him a true-born son of their own. When this happens, <laughs> well, children die all the time. So do fathers. Even the beautiful Targaryens had bastards when brothers tired of their sisters. Many took the name Blackfire after the conqueror's own sword. When Aegon the Unworthy legitimized all his bastards on his deathbed, they rose up against his true-born heir. Westeros bled, Dorne yawned. For most of Westeros, the Blackfire Rebellion only proved what they already knew. Bastards are treacherous, born of lust and shame. But here in Dorne, lust is not shameful. We know that bastardy does not make a man more treacherous than another. Man does not need the help. Most boys dream of becoming a king's guard. Rich boys from good families get a chance. Smart boys stay at home and sing songs about them instead, opening purses and thighs, because the king's guard isn't really good for much else. There was one king's guard, I forgot the bastard's name, who swore an oath to his dying Targaryen king to crown his daughter after him. The very night that king died, his king's guard crowned the king's son instead. When an old man on the small council dared to protest, this honorable knight opened his throat. Bastard died in the very civil war he started, along with the old king's son, daughter, and most of their dragons. And the king's guard? All that duty and honor, and not enough brains to figure out which Targaryen to give it to. Twin brothers even ended up on opposite sides, died with tears on their cheeks as they cut each other down. I suppose I should think that's tragic, but stupid men do stupid things every day. 
and nobody cries over them. Prince Aemon, the Dragon Knight, may be the most famous Kingsguard who ever lived. How did he die? Defending Aegon the Unworthy from the brothers of a man whom Aegon fed to his dogs. The man's crime? Sleeping with one of the many mistresses Aegon wasn't using. And the man was one of Aegon's own Kingsguard. Arthur Dane, Gerald Hightower. Sure, if half the stories about them are true, they could swing a sword better than most. Makes their lives even more of a waste. Bodyguards to the maddest king the Seven Kingdoms ever saw. Watching their king burn men alive. Standing guard as their king raped his queen. Hiding the Stark girl that Prince Rhaegar stole away. Causing a war that toppled their king. And all this without any gold or women to show for it. Stupid buggers. The only one with any sense was Jaime Lannister. When his father stormed the city, he put a sword through the Mad King's back rather than die gloriously at his post. He's still here. They're not. Even if the King's Guard are the greatest knights in the realm, knights are just asses in armor, riding whatever horse their daddies gave them. Putting on a white cloak doesn't make a man smarter or bolder. It's just a pretty little curtain. Behind it is the same pile of shit. All boys dream of becoming knights. The boys with talent dream of becoming king's guard. The boys without talent? Well, I wouldn't know. I remember the day the Lord Commander wrote my name down in the White Book, the official record of the king's guard. At 16, the youngest member ever to join. Knighted by Sir Arthur and Sir Barristan for valor against the Kingswood Brotherhood. An outlaw had decided to try his luck against a lowly squire. He wasn't using his head, so I took it off him. Shortly afterwards, King Aris II, who hadn't yet earned the title of the Mad King, took me into his service. If I have ever been happy, it was that day. For centuries, the King's God had been the glory of the realm. Aegon the Conqueror had established the Order as his personal guardians after uniting Westeros with fire and blood. He knew that some of his subjects wouldn't take to conquest, and his dragons were no use against knives in the dark. No doubt surrounding himself with the greatest knights in Westeros made his rule more palatable and less foreign as well. Everyone in his kingdom soon knew the names and sung the songs of the King's God. I certainly did from my earliest days. Lord Commander Gerald Hightower, the White Bull. Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. Barristan Selmy, the Bold. Prince Lewin Martell. Oswald Went. Jonathan Derry and, soon enough, the boy prodigy, me. We protected the king and his family. We killed his enemies and led his armies. We gave him counsel when asked and kept his secrets when not. We swore to hold no lands, take no wives and father no children, like the Night's Watch, except with a real job to do. Was I awed to see my name inscribed in the same book as my heroes? Of course not. I was 16 and brilliant. I knew it belonged there. Beside the name of Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, who wielded the Valyrian sword Dark Sister, he died defending King Aegon the Unworthy from assassins, though the king had insulted Aemon throughout his reign and had well earned his fate, because Prince Aemon had sworn our oath. Beside the name of Sir Gwain Corbury, who dueled the Targaryen bastard Daemon Blackfire for an hour during the Battle of the Red Grass Field, though outmatched and grievously wounded, because Sir Gwain had sworn our oath. Beside the name of Sir Duncan the Tall, who as a hedge knight broke several of Prince Arian Targaryen's teeth while defending a Dornish woman, he later rose to Lord Command and burned beside his king at Summerhall, because Sir Duncan had sworn our oath. And now, below the name of Jamie Lannister, you know how it reads. What I did, even though I had sworn our oath. That was years and a hand ago. When I joined the King's Guard, I fought beside legends in the flesh. Their kind is dust now. And the men who have taken their place? Mud. Sir Boris Blunt, the fat. Sir Marin Trant, the forgettable. Sander Clegane, the dog who tucked tail and ran. Like mud, their names soiled the white book. Almost as much as mine.
Twice, the Targaryens tried to conquer Dorne with soldiers. Twice, they failed. Only when the Dragon Kings came bearing husbands and wives did my ancestors relent and agree to join their seven kingdoms. House Martell could have waged war until the end of days. But how could we resist a peace we could take to bed? For centuries, the Iron Throne had no more loyal ally than the Princes of Dorne. Since we had never fallen to them, we kept our ancestral title. Perhaps this is what drew Rhaegar Targaryen to us. His royal parents had not produced a sister for him to wed, so he had to look elsewhere for a princess. And there was only one in Westeros, Elia of House Martell, my sister. She was not the most beautiful woman in the world or even in Dorne, but rare for a woman from our land. Her flower came with no thorns. She was kind and clever, with a gentle heart. I loved her. I feared for her. For years I fended off lesser men from her. But when Rhaegar came, even I failed. He was beautiful and the crowned prince of the Seven Kingdoms. And our mother had worked so hard to secure the match, how could Elia not accept him? They were wed and he took her from her home from those who loved her and would die for her, and locked her in his red keep above his sty of a city surrounded by false friends. She bore him a daughter and a son, though each almost cost her her life. Elia loved Rhaegar. She obeyed him, and he chose to steal away Lyanna Stark, a pale northern girl whose veins ran with ice like all her people. Instead of disciplining his faithless son, King Ares executed the Starks when they came seeking justice and ignited a revolt. I know how the Maesters describe the war now, but calling it Robert's Rebellion does not change what it was. The War of the Usurper. Dorne sided with the Crown, for when we swear oaths, we keep them. We needed no threats from King Ares, though he made them anyway, locking Elia and her children in the Red Keep to ensure our loyalty. Even in his madness, he knew that no true Dornishman would ever take up arms against our beloved princess, and that we would fight to the death for whichever side she was on. At the Trident, Dorn lost 10,000 men and two princes, my uncle in the King's Guard and Elia's gallant husband, Prince Rhaegar, who was too slow or too arrogant for Robert's war hammer. As Robert's army marched on King's Landing, the Mad King sent his own wife and child away, but kept my sister and hers inside. In his madness, Ares thought that the Dornish had betrayed his son at the Trident, and was only too happy to welcome his one true friend back into his ranks, Tywin Lannister. Lord Tywin's army sacked his friend's city while Lord Tywin's son murdered the king he'd sworn to protect. All this could have been forgiven. War is terrible, and men must become terrible to wage it. But the Lannisters knew that as long as my sister and her children, Prince Rhaegar's heirs, lived, no usurper could safely sit the throne. So Lord Tywin's dog, Sir Gregor Clegane, the Mountain, made Elia watch as he murdered her daughter and dashed her infant son's head against a wall. Then. With her baby's blood still on his hands, he raped my sister and murdered her. When Lord Tywin later presented their bodies to Robert Baratheon wrapped in pretty Lannister cloaks, I have been told the red color graciously hid the blood from men's eyes. The Targaryens talk of fire and blood. In Dorne, our blood is fire. If Robert Baratheon had dared set foot in Dorne during his reign, he would have lost the foot and it is not even him we blame for Elia. The Lannisters think their gold buys them power. The Lannisters think their mountain buys them strength. But if they want peace, they cannot buy it with mountains of gold or one mountain of steel. They must pay in blood. <laughs>